the show on the road. Um, okay, so a few things about me. Uh, I'll just an introduction slide in a second where it's like my name and stuff. But like, first I'm going to tell you all the ways that I'm broken as a person. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I have this pet peeve of um, when, so I run a conference called OSMJS, and so I do a lot of speakers. But one of my pet peeves is uh, when speakers make excuses before they even talk. Um, but the cool thing about the screen is that I don't have presenter notes. So, that's fine, that's cool, whatever. But it does mean that I'm going to be about as surprised as the next slide as you are, because there's 200 of them. So, I'm not saying that as an excuse, I'm saying that we're, we're going to go along for this ride together. And there might be some fun surprises along the way, and we'll, we'll, we'll discover them roughly at around the same time. So I think uh, it's just more for your own enjoyment when I look at a slide and go, hmm. Like, that's kind of the background context. I think, I think it'll be good. Uh, cool. All right. So let's, uh, let's like, like I said, 200 slides. So we should probably get the show on the road, right? Uh, so first and foremost, my name is Steve. Um, that's that's it. It's pretty easy. Uh, I work at a company which, as of today, is called SunGrid. In 88 days, it might be called Twilio. Um, I don't know. I, I found out what everyone else did. They also sent us a uh, SEC lawyer approved. Uh, blurb that I'm allowed to talk about. I have not read that blurb. <laughs> so, probably I'm already going to jail. <laughs> so, that's good. Uh, we are hiring. Uh, I made a bit.ly link because I live in 2009. Uh, and th there's not a fee involved there, that means front end engineer. We're hiring a front end engineer two role, so like two to five years experience. Um, for those of you who actually read uh, job posting for the years of experience, I don't. Um, I will just apply and see how it goes. Um, cool. And so, what's on the next slide? Uh, at one point, this is not a very big screen, which is cool, um, but code tends to be small, and trying to fit it on PowerPoint slides can be hard. Um, so, all of the kind of uh, meaty code that I show at some point, especially for my friends in the back, if you can't um, see it, I will, it is available to you, and you can see it later. That'll be great. Um, and I will put the slides there too. Uh, all morning as I was like tweaking the font on slides, I was like, I should upload these, and I would see some dank meme, and <laughs> not. So I will try to do those, unless the internet bites me again. All right. So what are we doing this talk? We're going to talk about AWS for front-end engineers. So that's, you know, hopefully you got that. So we're going to talk a little bit about deploying rich client-side applications and all the fun that comes with that on AWS. And some of this is inspired um, by what we do at SunGrid right now with our client-side applications, starting from what we did around 18 months ago, and I'll show you how bad that was. Um, to kind of what we do now and a little bit about what we are kind of like in the process of implementing. Um, this, that said, like we're going to cover a lot of stuff in a very brief amount of time, especially because I have another talk right after this one. Um, if this is super interesting to you, I also did like a, and you're like, hey, 25 minutes of this jerk speaking wasn't enough. Uh, I want to see like four hours of it. There's like an upcoming front end master's course where you can hear me ramble about this stuff and do it all live for like four straight hours. Um, my friend Mark Gravinsky, who runs front end masters, dubbed it as the third most boring course he's ever watched. <laughs> <laughs> he couched that, he's very direct, but he couched that with saying, not because I was boring, just simply four hours of AWS is, is brutal. So this is the 25 minute version. Um, if that is if that is not up, you are hungry for more. You can you can go and endure that. Um, as you figured out, probably watching me on two X is not the best idea. Right, Mary? <laughs> All right, cool. All right. So a year ago, around the time I started, I've been there about 18, 19, 20. I don't know. Right, like a long time. Um, we so the marketing campaigns application I work on. So it's not usually known for their API. Uh, I don't work on that. So if you don't like the API, sorry. Uh, I work on the marketing campaigns application, which is basically Sankar realized that not everyone is a developer, and maybe we make something for people who aren't developers. 
Um, so it's basically a few different kinds of editors. One just code editor, you write some HTML, you see it in the preview. And another one where you drag and you drop stuff and it's all fancy pants. Um, so. And so it used to be a side project of the company and now it makes like $20 million a year, like accidentally. <laughs> um, so that's cool. It started out in, I think the original version was maybe built in 2013, 2014. And you might have been like, yeah, Angular and Ember, and React was even a thing there. Of course, being a API company, we did it in CoffeeScript and jQuery and Rails in 2014. Um, and so that was still, we're now on our third, our second rewrite, right? The first one, the first time we write is not a rewrite, right? So we're on the third writing of it. Uh, but the first one was a Rails app, and the second one was kind of like built on top of like the burial ground of the first one. Like, you know, Seattle has a second city underneath. Uh, same basic concept. So it was also a Rails application. That Rails application was located in the city of Chicago. Uh, technically it's MDW, which I guess like is the name of the data center. I assume that's near Chicago. It could have been like farmland. But you know, whatever. Um, which meant that if you were trying to access the application from Bangalore, you had to make it pretty far to get that application, right? And like we have the metrics. That was about 18% of our user base, right? It I think it took about 30 seconds to fully boot up the application if you were on a slow internet connection on the other side of the world, right? Not great. Um, and I told you, like the second, the, if you logged in right now, it is a React application. But I told you it was still on top of that older jQuery CoffeeScript application, which meant anytime we wanted to deploy a client side application, effectively a text file, we had to deploy all of Rails, right? Even though we were barely using any of Rails at that point. So it wasn't great. Um, next slide, let's see what we got. And that is a picture of the planet. <laughs> Showing you that Chicago is far from other places on the planet. <laughs> you didn't think you were going to get a geography lesson, did you? Uh, all right. So when we first started spiking out the application, um, my buddy Mark and I did some metrics here, which is we looked at the difference in um, time to first byte. There's a bunch of metrics for web performance. Uh, time to first byte is like how long from when you sent the request that you actually get the first byte of a response back from the server. So that's very important for if you are like in Sydney and you're trying to get to something in Chicago. Then there's also obviously other meaningful things like time to first meaningful paint. For an application, that's not totally the most important. Like for New York Times, time to first meaningful paint, super important. For the developed Denver website, time to first meaningful paint, super important. For an actual rich application, we're all very comfortable watching that little bar in Gmail go because we know that once the application is up and running, we're using it all day. So I care a lot more about time to interactive. But you can't have a good time to interactive if you are waiting a really long time to even get the first byte. Right? So I was, you know, this is more of a story today about deployment, uh, not necessarily about React performance. Um, so you can see that time to first byte from Denver before we did all this was 5.6 seconds. Uh, afterwards, it was about 1.4, so it was about, 100, about just over twice as fast. Sydney, however, 1,300%, right? You might wonder why it was faster from Sydney than from Denver, I don't know. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't make the numbers up, I simply run the web page test script multiple times and put it into a spreadsheet like an automaton. So, as you can see, like, moving towards some of the stuff we're going to talk about today in this story will like, have meaningful gains for the performance of your application. Also, now we hit two buttons in build kite and deploys rather than deploying Rails every time. Because let me tell you, that's not fun. Um, cool. So we're going to look at how to build this. Um, let's get us into the room. How many will start like at the, at the top level? How many are like professional AWS solution architect solutioneers? We got one. How many are like... Um, I have, S, I have S3 before. What S3 again? And how many are, I have been living with a nagging guilt that I don't know any about any of this stuff, and I'm really happy that at least I'll be conversational by the end of this. Cool. All right. So we got a pretty good mix here. I am going to kind of, it is going to be playing more towards that, like those last two, um, because it's a 25 minute talk. Um, it's more than a 25 minute talk, but you know, I've already, like, once you subtract the jokes, it's about 25 minutes. <laughs> um, cool. All right, so we're going to talk about, and we'll do a little bit of like the summer theory, a little bit of, and the reason me posting the slides 
and not getting distracted by memes is important is like I will show you some of the step by step of how to configure some of this stuff as long as like not just like hey S3 is great you should do it but like all right so for those of you who have logged into the AWS management console uh, let's just get a quick like thumbs up or thumbs down for the UX. <laughs> All right, we're pretty. We got some sideways stuff. I don't. Is that, was anyone a thumbs up? All right. So hence, I will take you through some of this because it's a Byzantine nightmare. Otherwise, and hopefully you can just look at these slides and just click around. It's fine. It's either that or learn Terraform. So, good choice. Um, cool. So we want to get a single page application hosted on AWS. Otherwise, this talk is kind of pointless. Uh, distributed globally, so it's as quick or somehow faster in Sydney than it is in Denver. There are CloudFront nodes in both Denver and Sydney. I don't know why it's faster. Um, we'll get it secured by SSL, because that seems important. Um, we'll get it automatically deployed to CICD, and we'll get it to dynamically respond to requests. That's very big, and I'll explain it at the end. Because that's the part I'm most excited about. We'll start with, like, here's how to put a file on S3, and then we'll get to, like, here's how to modify requests in flight at edge nodes on the CDN. Be fun. We're not going to cover servers because it's for front end engineers, and we're not going to cover server lists because those are just two large topics in and of themselves. Um, that's, that second one is kind of not real, but we'll, we'll talk about it. Also, <laughs> server lists are just other people's servers. Um, it is fun. <laughs> um, first and foremost, we talk a little bit about uh, user management. Uh, I'm not going to drag you through all the fun of creating a user in AWS, but we'll just talk about one or two of the high level things. Um, cool, so in AWS it's called IAM, which is Identity, Access, and Management, and I didn't know that until I made this slide. <laughs> um, so yeah, basically it's how you manage sub-accounts. Uh, I had a meeting yesterday and uh, one of the um, people who runs our intern program forgot the word for sub-user, she, she called them babies. <laughs> uh, so that is the new way that we refer to them, as Sangrid, is there are users and babies. Uh, so same, same basic concept, you have a root account and then you have your babies. Uh, with your root account, like treat it like a root on your computer, don't use it unless you absolutely need to, because if you lose control of your root account, someone is going to get you a nice big fat bill. Right, and someone on your team on a long enough timeline is going to push your credentials up to get up. Somebody, right? You're gonna be like, yeah, let's hire like an intern. Like they're gonna push the credentials up to get up. You know, we all know it's the most senior engineer in the company who's going to do it. Um, the intern would never do something like that. It's obviously always the principal engineer that does it. Um, so principal of least access with your babies. You want, like, like most babies, you want to keep them as safe as possible and give them access to as few as things that they shouldn't have, right? Like, it's why we lock the cabinets, we'll keep the knives away from them, stuff along those lines. So generally speaking, like one of the big kind of like uh, principles here is, if, rather than have one master account that you use for everything, it probably makes more sense to make some accounts for absolutely everything that you need. Um, but here's just the kind of TLDR. Turn on multi-factor authentication, I know it's annoying. But you know what's even more annoying? Amazon customer support when someone runs up a $10,000 bill. <laughs> um, and then you can make an admin account that is separate from your root account. So you have like some kind of escape hatch that can do all of the uh, stuff that the root account can, right? But you're, like, you still have one more way to like pull the plug on that if you need to. And then for most other things, you're gonna create kind of super limited accounts, right? So if you want, you know, if you're going to deploy your application automatically with CI/CD, maybe you don't give them the admin account that can also like spin up Dynamo databases and mine Bitcoin on EC2, right? <laughs> maybe you just say, hey, you can publish a file to this S3 bucket, so on and so forth, right? So generally speaking, we'll actually make uh, a sub account in a little bit, uh, but these are just kind of the important notes on the slide. All right, let's talk about S3. Um, S3 is basically a way to put files in the cloud. Right, and for I, I obviously I am a front end engineer by trade. I believe that front end engineering is really complicated because of the DOM, um, but like it's really very kind of like takes a lot of the fun away to know that at the end of the day it's just a text file that you put. It's like effectively we can SFTP and things up like we did like uh, I did in 2014. Don't tell anyone. Um, <laughs> but like it is for all that hard work, it's a text file at the end of the day, and we do need to put that text file on the internet somewhere. Um, so, kind of, uh, for, you know, just kind of some of the terms, in your S3 account you have these things called buckets, which is a very technical term, uh, such as a 
occupies, you, you throw stuff in the various buckets. We'll call those objects. You might call them files. Um, you can put stuff in buckets. You can read stuff out of buckets. Um, you can host web pages out of buckets. That seems very useful for our purposes today. Um, it is quote unquote infinitely scalable. <laughs> I, that sounds like marketing bullshit to me, <laughs> uh, but that is, that is apparently the truth. Um, files can be as small as zero bytes, I don't know why, uh, or as large as five terabytes, I don't know how. 99.9% uh, .9 availability is what they promised, but it's the theory I could build for one additional nine. You might be like, that sounds great, that's still eight hours of outages a year, right? So like, ways you could mitigate that is, Amazon has distinct regions, you might decide to put your file in multiple regions, and then when one of the regions goes down, you can panic and like put everything to the other one. Uh, or you can be like cool with like not making money for eight hours a year. Either one. Uh, let me tell you which one we picked. Uh, <laughs> however, like while it might not always be available, it is built for a lot of nines. I believe that is eleven nines. Someone wants to count. I'm going to switch the slide before we get a chance. Um, I believe that's eleven nines of like your file might not be accessible all the time but it's not gonna go anywhere, right? Uh, probably more important if you're storing like medical histories than if it's your JavaScript app that you can totally rebuild from source again. But hey, here we are. Um, there's also sort of like life cycle management. So if you are building an application also like maybe it makes memes, right, of the dank variety. Uh, it might say like, we'll keep them available for a little bit and then maybe move them other places after a while if they're not accessed super often. You can do versioning. Uh, we're not going to cover that because like, ideally we are, we have our thing in source control, right? Not everyone nod. Uh, you can do encryption, which seems a little, a little much for a client side application, and other fun security things. Um, there's a bunch of different buckets. We're only going to use standard because like, we want our application to be as available as possible. But again, if you're storing images or any other kind of file, like let's say it's just simply like a PDF of somebody's like, 2008 tax returns. Like that's probably not super accessible. Like you're not accessing that regularly. You might want to go for other cheaper options. Standard is the most expensive. Not that any of this is particularly expensive. The other ones are cheaper. Like you'll know it when you need it. Glacier is technically not S3. It's basically they like write it to a disk and then put that disk like in a drawer somewhere. <laughs> and hopefully you don't need it. Uh, it's very cheap to do that. And if you do, they get very, like it takes a while, right? So standards, for our purposes of the point of hindsight application, the one that we want to use, but there are other options for other fun things you might decide you want to do. Uh, it's effectively a key value store. There's a notion of folders, but it's all a lie, right? They're just like file names and slashes in them. All right, so it'll show them to you as folders in the UI though. It's just a key value store where the key is some kind of path and the value is your file. Neat. Um, just a few things, this has never bitten me, but I feel responsible and I feel like I should tell you about this. Um, putting new objects in S3, as soon as you get a 200 response, uh, it means it's in there. However, when you remove or update files, eventually that'll happen. Uh, I have never been bit by this, but like theoretically if you are replacing the same file with the same name, it might take not instant. Uh, we use Webpack and we use like the fingerprinting on all of our files, so it doesn't really affect us anyway, but it's, it's a thing. And now I've done my due diligence and I've told you about that. Upload is free, you get charged for storage, you get charged for every time someone requests it. You're like, hey, my app is super popular. Uh, we'll talk about how to like make people not request it as much in a little bit. All right, so let's set up some S3. Um, real quick, in a series of screenshots, we are with arrows. Um, we're going to set up an S3 bucket. We're going to set a policy in the bucket. We're going to configure the bucket to host a static website. Again, that seems important for a JavaScript application. And then we're going to upload a simple React application via the command line. All right, so again, I told you. Uh, the Amazon UX is a highway, um, as of life is. So we can create a bucket, we're going to give it a name. Um, you should theoretically name it the name of your URL. I think that matters for when you host it directly out of S3, but not CloudFront. But it's never been the time that I've ever wanted to like, question that logic of wisdom and waste time. So 
let's just assume the rule is um, that we want to name it whatever the URL is eventually going to be. Um, and you can pick a region. Uh, US East 1 is the biggest and most popular and the one that goes down the most, so we'll pick that one. Um, cool. Uh, and we basically just want to go through all the basic settings because we're going to tweak stuff in a little bit. Uh, cool. Now you have your first brand new bucket. Mine is called mysuperfunwebsite.com. It is definitely an arms race because if you think that the bucket has to be named after the URL, you kind of need to make sure both are available at the same time because those bucket names are unique globally. So if you want to be like, I'm going to make a bucket called test. Probably <laughs> taken. Um, by Jeff Bezos is probably taken. Um, but you know, you can try it out. Cool, and then you, you could, if you want to go back to your like, um, basically if you've ever like just dragged a like index.html file into an SF, just, just an FTP client at all, and then they're like, yeah, it's on the internet. Like, Wasn't that great? <laughs> you can do that here technically if you want. Um, so I can take this fun HTML file, and that is not an issue code that I'm sharing because it's an HTML file. So if you go looking for that one, I'm sorry. I can send it online if you want, but it's an H1. Um, <laughs> you go ahead and add the files. Uh, you can upload it. All this fun stuff. I just kept hitting next at this point, to be really honest. We want standard, not standard and frequently accessed or anything like that. You can actually change the headers if you want and set all that stuff per file. And now you've got an index of HTML file. And uh, S3, aren't you glad you came for this talk? <laughs> um, there's a, I wonder how we do static web hosting. Anyone want to venture a guess which one? <laughs> Don't ignore the red arrow. Uh, cool. Um, so we, we open that up and then we turn that one on and we tell it what the index document is. In this case it is index.html. Some high level stuff, right? Um, and now we have, it is now hosted and we can go ahead and access it, right? There is a thing that we call policies, right? Policies are definitely a lot more important, especially if you're doing server-side programming, which is like, which of those accounts that are not your root account um, are allowed to access a given thing, right? Generally speaking, we're gonna cheat because like, we want the world to access our amazing React application, so we're gonna just basically say public people can get it, maybe they don't, we don't let them write to the bucket though, that would be bad. <laughs> um, you say that like most like, exploits are simply like somebody left an S3 bucket completely exposed. <laughs> Um, cool. So, I'm going to use the policy in a second. This is an example of a policy. Uh, the version, like, don't be fancy and be like, I want to use today's date. This is like whatever the last version of Amazon's uh, bucket policies are. This is the most recent version. Uh, we have three major important things the principle, the action, and the resource. What are those? The principle is who can do the thing. Uh, star is everyone, right? Everyone can get something from this bucket, right? So which bucket, if we go back a slide real quick, uh, we can see that it's whatever your bucket name is and it's all the files in there, and people can get an object from it. They can't write an object, they can't delete objects because that would be bad, uh, so on and so forth, right? So you can take that policy, and then you have to know that this button is here, and you can go ahead and paste that bad boy in. And then you get yelled at this bucket has public access because again, if you're storing like actual like stuff you shouldn't be sharing on the internet, this is bad. We are trying to deploy a client-side application, so this is our intent, but they make a bunch of stuff orange so that you feel warned about it. Not red, just orange. <laughs> cool, and now I have a web page on the internet. Um, now, once you've gotten the nostalgia of just dragging files from your desktop onto the internet out of your system, you probably want to do this maybe from the command line, right? <laughs> Um, right, and so AWS has some mobile tools and you can configure them and you put in whatever, whatever the credentials are when you made the account. Uh, fun fact that I didn't mention on the account creation stuff is that like you get to see those things once. If you lose them, you have to regenerate them and re-put them everywhere. So like you probably want to capture them somewhere. Um, you might be like, I use my computer for work and for play or we have multiple accounts. You can configure all this stuff to have, like your default, if you just do AWS configure, will be this. Um, but you can set up like multiple different kinds of accounts for different things, and like pick which one you want to use at a given moment. That you're all not like, yeah, that makes sense, I didn't know that. Uh, I literally was changing environment variables like an animal. Uh, anything you can do in that 
Byzantine UX, you can also do from the command line, which is equally as hard to crack. So that's cool. Uh, we can LS everything in our bucket, and so this is after a few deploys. Um, where you see we have the Webpack fingerprint stuff, we have some pictures of prints, because why wouldn't you? Um, <laughs> so on and so forth. That's not our real bucket. There's no secret pictures of prints, I promise you. <laughs> um, you can, this is a command for copying, in this case, if you're using something like, just create a React app, make a build directory or a disk directory, I don't remember. Um, build, oh well. If it did make a disk directory, this would move the entire disk directory out. I wrote my own Webpack, so. That we use the disk directory, but you can change that disk to build, and it would theoretically go ahead and take everything in that directory and go ahead and upload it to S3. And so now, every time you've built your application, you want to deploy it, you maybe make this just an NPM script. So I could do it like this, like you yarn run build, and go and upload it, or you can do like a deploy script, where you just take that same command line thing, and you put it in there, and now you just you yarn run deploy, and it will build it and deploy it. And you get in there, you're still doing it from your machine rather than off of master, but whatever. Um, so the question is, this will work if they just go to mysuperformwebsite.com. Um, but it won't work if they go to like slash notes slash three, right? Because that's not a file in your S3 bucket, right? React Router was cool with it when you were on the page, but it wasn't fine when you went directly to it. So we need to fix that. And so we go ahead and just cheat by making the error document, errors being 404s in this case, uh, we'll make that the index.html too. <laughs> <laughs> and then React Router will boot up and it'll all work. If it starts with feelings, it should. We'll fix it, I promise. Um, cool, so this has got some problems. The URL isn't great, doing this manually and get tedious. It's hosted in Virginia, uh, unless you picked a different region. No, no offense to Virginia, but like we've discussed, Virginia is not close to Sydney. Um, and the routing is kind of breaking the web. We'll fix all these things quickly. Uh, first, there's this thing called Route 53, which is a DNS service, and that stands for Domain Name Service, which takes fun URLs and makes them unfun URLs. <laughs> um, because, yeah, I, if you know what, like, Googling it has a better ring to it than, like, 52.84.23.1 in it. Um, but you know, whatever, random. Um, so in here, this assumes that you, you can actually register a domain through Amazon. You can use one through some other place if you want to as well. Um, but this is assuming that we have mysuperfunwebsite.com already registered. Who has already like bitten, like tried to go to mysuperfunwebsite.com? No one? All right, good. <laughs> it's real. Um, cool, and you go in there, and then it's again like the reason I make the screenshots is finding this stuff on your own is horrible. Uh, we'll go ahead and that manage DNS button is like deep in there that you have to go ahead and find, and then you can go to record sets. You don't remember all of this, right? You got this memorized. That's why I got to upload the slides. Um, and well, I like the base domain. You can do www as well. Um, we can make an A record, and theoretically, you should see your S3 bucket in there, and you can just pick it, and it will handle all of the other DNS stuff for you. Because who enjoys an DNS? We got one or two. I did like that was about what I was expecting. Uh, I, I don't actually understand. That. I just copy and paste whatever my register tells me to. Um, Cool, so let's actually get in some HTTPS as well. Uh, Amazon has this AWS Certificate Manager, which will give you free SSL as long as you're using Route 53, which is why we're using Route 53. Route 53, not free. So, well, it all depends on your, like, it's like 50 cents. It's okay. Uh, I think the whole website costs, like, I think about 56 cents a month. 50 cents of that is just using Route 53, so that's fine. Um, Cool, we'll request a public certificate, and then we'll hit that button that I keep missing every time. And we'll go ahead and we'll put in our URLs. Um, you can put as many as you want here. You can do like mysuperphonewebsite.com. You can do www.mysuperphonewebsite.com. You can you know, go to town, right? Uh, admin.superphonewebsite.com. Friends. Um, and then you do need to validate that this is all set up correctly. Uh, two ways you can do it. One is email validation. Uh, I like the DNS validation because we're already using Route 53, and Amazon can just kind of do it all for us. Uh, we'll see that in a second. I think it's pretty great. Um, so again, you do the review step, 
and then you think you're done because there's these spinning things. Um, you will never be done because you, <laughs> I mean, just in general, but also you do need to then validate that you actually own these domains and everything along those lines before they just let you generate certificates to like google.com because that would be bad. Um, so you do need to like validate it. Luckily, if you use Rapid 3 this is pretty easy. Uh, pending validation, and then you just click on each one. Yeah, it turns out that those two list items are really drop downs. You didn't know that from looking at it, did you? I didn't either. Um, you can go ahead and you can hit create record in Route 53, and it will do all of the DNS stuff. It'll basically add another DNS rec um, record in there to basically say, yes, I own this. It'll match it up. Like The certificate will look to make sure that you have the same like unique hash for both of them. And then you're ready to rock, and everything is really good in my um, and then you wait a little bit. Uh, it's a great excuse to like go get a beer or something. Uh, it's like the new version of like it's compiling. It's fun. Um, and it'll go ahead and set the C names with all the stuff in here. Cool. So now the URL uh, is both great and over HTTPS. Deploying still kind of stunk that I had to do yarn run deploy every time. Uh, still in Virginia. Anyone from Virginia? <laughs> like this, no, I'm not offending Virginia, it's just the farm. <laughs> uh, cool. Um, so now what we want to do is solve that original problem. We've got it on the internet. Um, it's not in Rails anymore. Very cool. Uh, it's in the cloud. Um, what we want to do is now globally distribute it. Um, application, as I mentioned, is in Virginia. Fun so, fact, some places are further from Virginia than others. Like if you are requesting this, this application right now from DC, it is great. If you're requesting from Denver, it is not bad. If you're requesting from Beijing, you're going to wait a little bit before you get that first byte because like, there's things like the speed of light and electrons only get through copper so quickly. Um, stinks. Um, cool. All right. Got to carry over the slides. So, rather than trying to figure out where all of our users are, we could go ahead, and, like, we can be like, okay, all the users are using this from Brazil, right? So we'll put it there, right? Like, that's not, the answer is put it everywhere, right? Um, and so we do that using a CDN, CloudFront is a CDN. Um, this map is, I think is not out of date, because I updated it like two weeks ago, but it is frequently out of date every time I have to update these slides. These are all of the edge node locations. So CloudFront has like little mini data centers all over the world, and so basically instead of going all the way to Chicago or all the way to Virginia, you go to whichever one is closest, right? And so our application, uh, this is the, like our fictitious one in Virginia, these are the different times of first bytes around the world. So you can see on the east coast of the United States, not bad, even on the west coast, not great though. Um, and as we get further away, it gets increasingly bad, and Turkey just timed out and gave up. <laughs> uh, that's nice. Um, cool. After we distribute it around the world, you can see it's a much better picture. Um, it's not great everywhere, but it is a lot less red on the screen. And like I said, the, those, uh, the South African nodes were just added, I want to say, two months ago. Uh, so this will, you don't have to do any work every time a new cloud, like they have to do a lot of work. You don't do any work. You're just like, hey, my application's faster in South Africa now. Yay. Uh, right, and you get it for free, so this is pretty cool, especially considering how much work it is. Um, CloudFront also supports HTTP2 out of the box, um, and that's, that's neat. Uh, previously, uh, HTTP1, basically you got one file at a time. Now, browsers are cheap, and they open up six connections at a time for a given uh, host, and then they try to reuse those connections, so they don't have to close them and open new ones. And so there's a lot of cheating involved here. And like, you used to have to do tricks, because they'll only open up six to a given host, so then what you would do is you put your images on one domain, and you put like a JavaScript on another, and then like, okay, there's too many from one, you start splitting your assets up, and like, that's not my idea of fun. Um, issue two basically opens up like one, because you know that the internet is made up of a series of tubes, it is one larger tube that multiple cats can walk through at the same time, um, and that's how you get your data. Um, and so you can concurrently stream the CSS, and you can actually do really interesting stuff like, if you're doing it right with HTTP2, you're like, okay, for this index.html, we already know they're going to need this CSS file, so let's already start sending it to them before we even start parsing the HTML. So HTTP2, good. Right, all browsers pretty much support it. Um, 
we don't have to do any work to get HTTP2, so this is great. This is like, fun fact, use CloudFront, you have HTTP2. Nice. Um, cool. The other part is, it will cache all of your assets at each one of those edge nodes. Remember I told you before that S3, you get charged by how frequently it's accessed, right? When you cache it at the edge node, you're not hitting S3. You're not hitting S3, which means you're not paying for that request. So on top of it being better for your users, on top of HTTP2, it's also cheaper for you to use CloudFront than it is for you to hit S3 every time as well. Uh, so that's pretty great. All right, so we're gonna look at creating a new CloudFront distribution. We're gonna point it at our cool static website on S3. Um, we're going to add our domain names instead of the S3 bucket. We'll set up gzipping for assets automatically, and we'll break uh, HTTP requests again. Um, so you go to CloudFront, you hit this, uh, this one's easy, right? It's easy to figure out what to do on this one, right? You hit that blue button, it's good. Um, cool, and then you hit this other one. The, like, CloudFront can also do like streaming media. That's beyond the scope of this today, but we will get started and hit that funny blue button right there. Um, we're, we're gonna paste in the uh, fully, uh, so before we made that, before we registered that nice domain name with uh, Route 53, we got this really gross one, uh, mysuperfunwebsite.com.s3-website-us-east1.amazonaws.com. Don't ask me how I remember that. Um, and we'll, we'll point it to that, that way. So now they go to CloudFront, CloudFront goes to that statically hosted website that we had earlier, but it will cache it on the way out. So once, it, once that edge node has gotten it once, um, then you are better off. Right, it won't have to. It won't go get it again. This is actually good too, because if theoretically uh, CloudFront is globally distributed, if S3 and US East one goes down, uh, and an edge node has it already, right, that South African edge node has it, we won't be affected by the outage. We can't deploy again, right, because we won't be able to like, we'll still be down. But like, the application will theoretically still be responsive to users, uh, which means we kind of get a little bit of multi-region for free, but we should still set up. Multi um, we'll compress objects automatically. That will just gzip everything. I don't know why you wouldn't want to turn that to yes, because uh, gzipping makes stuff smaller. Um, cool. And then we'll put in the alternate domain names, C names, which will be our the ones we registered earlier. All right. Very cool. The default root object will be index.html, just like it was in our S3 bucket. And then it takes forever. <laughs> like go go home. Right, if you, like, a watch CloudFront never distributes or something like that, so I don't know what it says. Um, it, like, secretly it'll start because it's distributed. Like, turns out it takes time to distribute something around the world. Um, like, it'll, it'll theoretically work before that happens, but, like, every time you make a change, you will watch this when it go forever. My buddy Steven likes to say, CloudFront puts the eventual and eventual consistency. Um, cool. We will update that DNS real quick because you still point, if they go to mysuperfunwebsite.com, they're not getting the CloudFront version yet, which stinks. Um, they're still getting the S3 version. So you're like, I did all this work. They're still going to Virginia for it until you just point the domain name. Um, you should be able in the drop down to see the CloudFront thing. Uh, if you go and do this and you get really excited and then you don't see it there, please don't panic. I, like, I was surprised the first time it was actually there. Like everything in CloudFront, it takes four. So if you like I set the platform distribution, you run over at Route 53 to like pick it from the drop down menu, it probably won't be there. Uh, you can just paste in the URL, it's fine. Like I didn't know that it would ever show up until I went back to like change it one day. And I was like, oh, it's there. Um, cool, and you can do the same thing for the www as well. Um, so some headers. Uh, CloudFront by definition will discard all of your headers. You're like, why would it do this? Because it's caching. Right, those headers could mean something, and the requests could be different. Right, so if there are headers that are important for your application, you do need to whitelist them. Right, if you do not whitelist them, they'll be thrown in the garbage can. Um, that said, don't whitelist headers you don't need because you're, you're like that's a new cache every time. Right, you want to cache as much as possible, so you whitelist as many as few headers as you can get away with. Right, as many as you need, as few as you can get away with. If, however, you want, CloudFront will actually add a few extra bonus ones that you can whitelist. So this is pretty cool. It'll like tell you if like, okay, it's a mobile app or a desktop application based probably on the user agent string, I'm assuming. Um, so theoretically, like you could get very fancy at some point and like serve smaller images to mobile clients because user agent sniffing has never bitten anyone. 
Um, but yeah, so you can do some cool stuff. It'll actually add in a whole bunch of like different data that you can theoretically do stuff with. Um, cache validation, along with naming things, is one of the three hard problems in computer science. Um, we've distributed this thing around the world. All but one error is the third. Um, and that was an old joke. Come on. Um, <laughs> Cool. Uh, so we do. So all of a sudden, you deploy your application. You realize you have a bug. You need to deploy again. It's cached, right? Tough. You do need to. You can theoretically tell CloudFront to invalidate the cache. You get a thousand uh, cache invalidations a month for free, um, and that is a cache invalidation. Doesn't matter if it's one file or all the files. So we tend to just invalidate all the files on every deploy. And then somebody from architecture every time reminds me that I only get 1,000 free invalidations a month. And I tell them that if I am deploy if we are deploying more than 1,000 times a month, let's just pay the two cents, right? <laughs> if we are so productive that we are shipping new features like 30 times a day, we'll do it. OK? Like, that's the least big problem in the world. But somebody always tells me that every time. So. Um, so the way, you know, like if you use unique names for the files, like the Webpack fingerprinting, theoretically, like that new file, your index.html file will still be cached. So that stinks. But like you theoretically get away with it by naming your files a different way. I just bust the cache every single time and deal with it. Uh, cool. So we can set up some CI CD process. I'm not gonna go too deep into this because I'm gonna show you how to create a subuser. I'm gonna go too deep into this because like you might not be using Travis. I chose Travis because it's free for open source. We don't use Travis the same grid we use. We used to use Jenkins, we now use BuildKite. Um, but it's the same basic idea. Um, cool, so we're gonna set up a user, we're gonna add it in. Um, so this is back to those subusers, our babies as we mentioned earlier. And so we can go ahead and create a new subuser, and we probably want to give it a new policy. In this case, you can choose a service. I'm going to choose CloudFront or S3 that can write to S3, and the way you need to invalidate CloudFront caches. The only two things you should be able to do. So, so you can write to the S3 bucket, because I don't want to let it like, set up like EC2 instances in my Bitcoin if Travis CI ever gets hacked. Um, so we go ahead and we tell like a specific bucket. So you want to limit it as much as possible, so like TLDR. Um, cool. And then you might not see that because I didn't. And go ahead and we can add in CloudFront. You can say I started typing the word CloudFront, it's great. And you can give it just create validations. Cool. Review it. We're only going to give it programmatic access because the Travis CI should only be able to use the CLI. It should not be able to log into the console. That's weird. Um, so that's all it needs. Very cool, and we'll get the um, we'll get the uh, secret and access key for everything. That'll be cool. All right. We'll have a new user in Travis. You can go ahead and add it. The important part is you made that user. It has a secret and a key. You find your repo, turn it on. Again, this might be different for the CI/CD tool that you use. Uh, the more important part is that you. Add it as environment variables, right? Because like depending on which one you use, it's going to need it. Travis will let you encrypt them so that like nobody can actually see them, which is probably really good and important. And you should totally do that too. That's an option for you. So I can put in all my access key and my secret key, and those are encrypted. I chose not to encrypt my CloudFront ID and my S3 bucket because I might want to see those. But that's really up to you. Cool. And then you can go like create a new file. Um, so this is just the setting for Travis. Again, this might be different for your CI CD tool, um, but this is the one I wrote and it's available for you if you choose to use it in that link that I will show you again like two more times by the end of this talk. Cool, make a commit. I commit it directly to master, like a, like a badass. Um, and it will build, and it will deploy. So if you want to see that script, if you decide to use Travis for your project, you're like, I want to deploy my blog. I will use Travis, it's fine. Um, you can see the script that I had in there. Uh, cool. Uh, so the all different ways you can handle caching, you can bust the cache, you can set a lo relatively low time to live, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, cool. All right. Now we'll get to the fun part with very little time. It'll be great. Um, so, recently if you heard of AWS Lambda. Cool. So the TLDR on that is a bunch of functions that run based on events that happen. 
Uh, and Lambda is very cool. Lambda is like the whole like serverless thing. Uh, we can be like, hey, I'm going to hook this up to an API gateway and write to a DynamoDB database. The one that I'm very into is Lambda at Edge. So Lambda at Edge is basically a way to program your CDN. So it means on all of those little edge nodes around the world, you can actually write code that executes on every request and every response, which allows you to do some really interesting things. It was only announced last November, so it's, I think, it's still early days for this. Um, but it allows you to do some really interesting and cool things. Um, any request that comes in, we can, we can intercept. Any response going out of our CDN, we can intercept. We can actually do it in two places. When the browser goes to CloudFront, we can do stuff. When CloudFront goes to S3 or whatever, in our case it's S3, we can do stuff on the way out, we can do stuff and on the way out of CloudFront, we can also do stuff. You're like, what is stuff? Um, so there's a few requests is executed every time someone goes to hit that, right? They're going to CloudFront. So CloudFront will allow them to do it every time and see what's going on. You could say like, hey, like right now we still do a bad thing, which is we wait for all the React app to get parsed and booted up before we find out you're not logged in. And then we kick you out to the login page. What I would like to do is have it set up, oh, you don't have an auth header? See ya. Right. Uh, and to take them to the login page then before I send them an entire JavaScript application. Uh, that would be cool. Uh, you can go ahead and make API requests if you really needed to. You can like modify that. You can normalize all the, normalize the cache headers if you need them, and stuff along those lines. The origin request, leaving CloudFront, going to S3 in this case. Um, you can again hit other APIs if you needed to get additional data. Like I don't have a server, all I have is this S3, but I need to get something from the Twitter API. Go ahead and do it. You can. You don't have a lot of time to do it, but you can do it pretty quickly. Um, you can rewrite URLs if you need to. Uh, a bunch of really fun stuff like that. Um, so now S3 responds. Again, we can do a few things. I did not use this one too much, but we can say like, okay, maybe that wasn't really a cache miss uh, when they got to like a very real client side route. And then viewer response, again, is leaving, um, and this will be every single time. <coughs> if it is cached, origin request and origin response will not execute, right? Because it's already cached. We're not talking to S3 at this point. Cool. Drawback is unclear where your logs are going to be. So uh, if, for instance, they went, they hit the edge node in South Africa, guess what? You got to go looking for the logs, right? And so in Denver, your logs might very well be in Ohio. Or they could be, I think, they, they could be in Ohio. Sometimes in California. Good luck. <sighs> Sorry. Um, cool. They sent to the nearest region. Uh, so this came out of a lot of like the work that we do with this came out of me arguing with one of the architects about how he wanted to make me use those ugly hash URLs that Twitter used in like 2014, and I am like, I'm a gentleman. Um, so what we could do theoretically is create one. This is the fast part. Um, so go ahead and we'll do a redirect request, I'm calling this one, the sub permission, which is, hey, if they had a known good client-side route, um, what we're gonna do is say that it's actually a 200. Right, and so what we'll do is like, we'll check it on the way in, so you can see that kind of first one up there. Hey, this is a known good client side route, so I'm gonna just actually ask S3 for index.html. That's gonna be a 200. So now, BS URLs will break, good URLs will be 200s, and I've unbroken the web. Again, this code is online. We can go ahead and publish it, and we'll add CloudFront as our source. This will only work in US East 1. So if you're like, I'm gonna do this in US West 2, you're not gonna see CloudFront. So that's important. We go ahead and put it in there. We'll say origin request. They hit CloudFront. CloudFront's like, I don't know about this URL. We'll change it to index.html if we know it's good. And then we'll get a 200 on known good client side routes. We'll get 404s on total BS routes. Cool. And then you have to hit that button or nothing happens. Take a minute. Take a snapshot of your eyes. It's hard, I know. Save. Cool. Uh, the code for that is, a co I have a bunch of codes. Like, by default, the, what we did today will not work. Uh, if you bring it, it'll work. If you put it in Mozilla Observatory for the security headers, you're gonna get an F, All right? Um, so what you could do is modify the security headers on uh, viewer response to like set all the appropriate, really responsible ones, and then you'll get all that done. You can also swap in images based on like different, um, you, know, you can write all of JavaScript. So all that code is available for you as well. 
Um, but that means that the URL is now good, it is secured, uh, we have it in CICD, I have it commit to master, it's hosted around the world, and we unbroke client-side routing in like a 48-minute tour de force. Things you could do with Lambda Data Functions, you could be testing, right? Okay, we did a dark thing, which is all even-numbered users got one experience, and all odd-numbered users got the other one, that was fun. Um, you can do like, create your own bit.ly in case you realize that like, you don't want to use it anymore. Because uh, Libya as a like TLD on that one is probably not a long-term game plan. Um, again, redirecting unauthenticated users, so on and so forth. And so that's it. All the code is available at bit.ly slash AWS FEM. Uh, if you want to come work with me and Mark, this is Mark, he's nice, I promise. Um, cool. And if you want to like have some on Twitter, that's a cool thing too. Thank you so much.